I think that we have actually moved from being uh, having decisions taken based on data to decisions taken by date. Uh, and my problem with that is that I think that the data increasingly says we could be unlocking before the 19th of July. Former Chancellor Sajid Javid was appointed Health Secretary after Matt Hancock was caught breaking COVID rules in his office. So what's the mood of the Tory party like, and will the new Health Secretary be more keen to end restrictions than his predecessor? I'm joined now by the Conservative MP and former International Trade Secretary, Dr. Liam Fox. Liam, thank you for joining Spectator TV. So it's been a week of revelations. Others might say rank hypocrisy after Hancock was discovered to be breaking the rules he mandated the nation follow. How damaging has this been to the Tory party's reputation and to the public's willingness to keep following the rules? I think the public are willing to follow the law. I think that's one of the key characteristics of the British people. I think that what is irritating people at the moment is that they see the rules uh, being applied in a very asymmetric way too many exemptions for reasons that are not entirely clear uh, and uh, a suspicion that we are now following dates, not data. You tweeted yesterday that while Brits are welcome in France if they've had two jabs, they have to isolate when they come back. Meanwhile, UEFA officials come into the UK and don't have to isolate, nor do apparently senior business executives if they're thought to be economically beneficial to the UK. Strange language, as I'm pretty sure small businesses play a vital role to the UK economy too. It just doesn't seem fair, does it? It doesn't seem fair because it isn't fair. Um, uh, if you can go to France having had two jabs because as public health England have told us, these jabs will cover you against all the known variants. Uh, and the French think that's perfectly reasonable. Uh, that's one case. Uh, you can't then come back from France uh, with the same two jabs that cover you for all the known variants to the UK for reasons that I can't quite fathom. Uh, and I think it's that lack of clarity and transparency that irritates people. And I think people, especially in places like the travel industry, uh, they are not stupid, they can read the data themselves. If we know the criteria on which these decisions are being taken, then people can monitor uh, the trends and they can get an idea of where we're going. I think it's the uh, arbitrary nature of some of these decisions, um, the way that they change with, without much notice, and the fact that we're not clear uh, about the criteria because there's, la there's a lack of transparency. I think that is potentially uh, a way to undermine public support and it can so easily be managed. Uh, I was saying in the House of Commons a couple of days ago, uh, we need better data. Right at the beginning, you'll remember, we were told so many people were admitted to hospital, so many had pre-existing conditions and so on. Now we're just told about the case numbers and the case numbers themselves don't actually tell us anything. If they're all children aged between 5 and 12, uh, that's not going to overrun the NHS, is it? Um, uh, we should know uh, which groups are, are actually being admitted. As, is it people, for example, who could have been immunised but chose not to be? And in the hospitalisation numbers, how long are people being admitted for? What's the net number of people in hospital, uh, inflow and outflow? How many of them require further treatment? How many go on to ICU? All these are bits of information that would enable the public and Parliament to understand better the nature of the decisions being taken. Uh, and all I'm asking for, which I think is not unreasonable, is the fair application of the rules and greater transparency about decision taking uh, and what data uh, that is actually being based upon, uh, I think that most people would think that was an entirely sensible and reasonable thing to ask for. I suppose those who would defend these exemptions would say, look at Wembley this week where we saw spectacular scenes of the England team beating the German team. It was a wonderful moment for the nation, a huge boost to morale. UEFA were threatening to take the semi-finals and finals out of the country if they didn't get their exemptions for thousands of VIP guests. Perhaps they defend it by saying, well, this trade-off was worth it. Well, it may well be defensible politically. It may well be defensible in terms of people's enjoyment. Is it consistent with the, with the rules um, on public health? Uh, apparently it is, but on what criteria? Uh, I think that we have actually moved from being, uh, having decisions taken based on data, to decisions taken by date. 
Uh, and my problem with that is that I think that the data increasingly says we could be unlocking before the 19th of July uh, and we should be looking at that data. Uh, we're getting increasing evidence that the hospitalisation and the death rates are not rising in anything like the same proportions as the number of cases we have. There's clearly a, a break in the link, which is what you'd expect when you've got a vaccine that covers you against most of the variants. In fact, all the known variants that we have at the present time. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, having begun the vaccination programme so early and having given the British people a great advantage, that the government are squandering that to an extent and that what could have been a great vaccine dividend for the British people is being denied by uh, an over-application of the precautionary principle. And at some point, you know, I'm, I'm a medic, you know, before I was, a, I was a politician, the medical profession will want to drive the numbers down to the lowest possible level. That's not the same aim as the government. The government needs to be to make sure that, they, that there's not a higher level of infection than there needs to be in, uh, at a level that's consistent with the opening up of the economy, the maintenance of people's jobs, the running of the health service to a more efficient level, dealing with some of the groups left behind, getting our children back to school and making sure that our families and friends can be reunited because that's a vital part of our social and, and mental health. So uh, the government's aims have to diverge from their medical advisors' aims at some point. I think we're at that point. It does seem increasingly likely that the 19th of July will go ahead after this four-week delay, but how free will we actually be, Liam? Because it's clear that international travel is certainly not resuming normal services anytime soon. And if people are worried about getting pinged by test and trace and having to self-isolate for nearly two weeks, their behaviour may not return to normal. Well, there is a very big question uh, about test and trace. If we're not actually in a public health emergency, uh, and all our restrictions are lifted after the 19th of July, what business is it of the state where uh, citizens go to eat or drink? Um, and there's a question then about the validity uh, or, and, and the justification politically and morally uh, of that system if we don't have a public health emergency that it's underpinning. So I think there'll be quite a big debate around that. There's a new health secretary in town now, Sajid Javid, with your medic hat on, as well as your politics hat on. What do you make of this appointment? And do you think he's going to be giving you the data that you were just talking about that you're so desperate to see? Well, he did say in an answer to my question in the House of Commons that yes, we would see more data. So that would be a great thing. In fact, I think it's a good thing all round. Um, the, the more that we can show why decisions are taken and people can understand uh, the data uh, and empirical basis for decision making, the more there's likely to be acceptance of those decisions. So I, I hope that we, we get uh, that. We are entering a different phase uh, and it's a chance for Sajid Javid to make his name, I think, as, as Health Secretary by taking the public and Parliament more into the trust of the government. And I think that would be a good thing all round uh, for the public, for Parliament and for the government. You also said in the comments this week that Parliament needs to be taken in confidence. I think you're hinting at it here, but to what extent do you think that the government has been ignoring its backbench MPs during this crisis? I don't think it's, it's ignoring. I think it's just that we've had this odd dynamic of uh, announcements being made by Downing Street press conference rather than proper discussion in the House of Commons. Uh, we don't have proper debates in the House of Commons uh, because... Uh, uh, the system's being altered because of COVID. Uh, I think that one of the things that we need to get if we're going to hold the government properly to account are changes in Parliament itself. Um, having ministerial statements where you get one question but no follow-up uh, is no way to scrutinise uh, an executive and, and we need Parliament to go back to normal as quickly as we, we can get it so that uh, the government can be held to account and, and we can ensure that we get the information that we want. So we, we would all win um, from that, Parliament would be uh, functioning better, the public would be better represented, and the government would actually function better, as governments always do, when they're being properly held to account, even if they don't enjoy the process. Let's assume that at some point the rules that apply to the powerful will apply to everyone else, as we've been discussing. Are you worried about a system that creates perks for the double jabbed, creating a new two-tier system in its place, essentially the jab versus the jab nots? Well, the aim then, of course, is for everyone to take up the, the, the jab, and I've had mine. Um, I would advise everybody um, to get it. Um, it's no, uh, there's no compunction uh, in Britain for people to get it.
but people who don't get uh, their immunisation can't expect, for example, to have the same international travel as people who do get it. That's always been the case. If, for example, you decided you didn't want to get a yellow fever jab, you couldn't go to certain places in Africa. So the principle's no different from before. Uh, and I think that people are you know, perfectly entitled, if they choose, not to get the jab. They should think about their own health and they should think about public health as part of their civic responsibility. But if they choose not to get it, that's their right. But they also have to understand that with rights will come uh, responsibilities and consequences. Um, we've seen vaccine passports coming into the UK without really so much of a discussion in Parliament. At Wembley, for example, you either have to show your job status or you have to show a negative COVID test. This has not been properly debated. Does that worry you? Well, again, I think that Parliament needs to be given more time um, and better uh, conditions to, to properly have these debates. Uh, the way in which we've been doing virtual Parliament uh, which has basically restricted us to three minutes. It's what I sometimes refer to as the CBB's Parliament with a three-minute attention span. Um, I think that needs to change, um, and I think we need to be able to discuss these things uh, more widely and in more depth than we can with the time limits that we have at the present uh, in Parliament. So uh, that needs to change. Um, as for the international element, I think that's well established. So I think people who don't have a jab uh, can't expect to have the same international travel rights. Um, and we have a right as a country to expect people coming in to be able to prove that they've been immunised uh, if they want to be free to travel within the UK. The difficulty then comes, as you alluded to, uh, about different differential rights in the country between those who've had jabs and those who haven't. That, I think, as you say, has not been really properly debated. Um, there are all sorts of conflicting things there about the rights of uh, private companies, of private uh, uh, facilities to determine who comes in. Uh, to their facilities. So it's a, it's a complex debate, uh, which, as I say, requires a lot more than, than we've been able to have in Parliament so far. Last question, Liam. I hate to bring it up, but there's already talk about upping restrictions this winter to curb the virus. What data would you need to see, including a surge in infections or hospitalizations, to decide whether or not we need another lockdown, dare I say, or at least more restrictions again? Well, if you saw uh, another COVID variant different to what to what we've had before uh, that wasn't just more transmissible but was actually more deadly then you'd have to think about it again that's unlikely because the way that viruses mutate largely by genetic drift rather than genetic shift uh, is is a generally is a slower process and I think that you can expect that these vaccines will uh, uh, be effective uh, for some time you may need a booster jab but but it will give a lot of protection to the population we will face, um, in all likelihood, an increase in the number of seasonal infections. That's not a reason to uh, put restrictions back on the population. We've gone through flu pandemics but when we didn't do that, and I don't think there would be a justification for doing it. And I think governments have to be very, very careful that they don't use uh, the justifications of a public health emergency to restrict our freedoms and then apply that to conditions which cannot really be described as public health emergencies, but are more an inconvenience. I think we have got to be very clear about um, our differentiation in those, in those cases. Liam, thank you so much for joining me. If you enjoy what we do on Spectator TV, then subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the button at the bottom of this video and then tap the bell icon to make sure you never miss an episode. And if you want to subscribe to the magazine, take up our 12 issues for £12 offer. You'll get three months of The Spectator in print and online for just £12, plus we'll give you a £20 Amazon voucher completely free. Just go to spectator.co.uk forward slash TV offer to take it up. Mm -hmm.